everyone. Welcome. We're so excited to have you here for our Romance for the Ages panel. I cannot thank you guys enough for coming. This is incredible and so much fun. I was chatting earlier with the authors when we were getting all of our technology set up and it was just I was geeking out. I was so excited as a, as a romance reader here. My name is McKaylee. I'm the director of marketing and events at Tattered Cover Bookstore. And first off, I just have to sincerely say thank you for continuing to support local businesses, specifically your local independent bookstore. You know, we've been in this quarantine now for a long time and it feels like forever some days, but <laughs> we are just so grateful for your continued support. Tattered Cover is now um, open online 24 seven. We had a couple of adjusted hours there and we started curbside pickup at our Colfax Avenue location. I know a lot of you were mentioning where you're from uh, in the chat earlier. And um, for those of you that are uh, Colorado residents who are willing to make the drive, you can do curbside pickup during limited hours but our website is always open and we're still doing shipping as well. And so I also just wanna say that closed captioning is available for those who might need it. Um, we are gonna be having this live stream recorded and on our YouTube channel later. So please share it with someone who, is, if one of your friends is not here tonight, but you wanna share it with them later, send them the link and they can still watch the full interview, which is a pretty cool thing that we can do with these virtual events now. We have more live streams coming up. Um, for you romance readers out there, we have Sarah Richardson, who has her latest cowboy romance coming out and we're gonna host her on Monday, June 15th at 5 p.m. here on our YouTube channel. And any of you who might have younger readers in your life, we have uh, children's author Avi and the illustrator Brian Floca on Thursday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, June 9th at 5 p.m. on YouTube. And I wanna just quickly reiterate, we've been saying this at the beginning of all of our live streams because we believe that this is really important here, but art is a survival resource. It's something that's vitally important, but has very few safety nets um, in the normal world and even in this crazy pandemic one. We're here to affirm that creative work is essential and we're here to elevate it. It's always gonna be our top priority. You know, the authors that we've chosen for these live streams have been chosen specifically because we absolutely love their work and we can't stand the idea that they don't have a platform right now. And we think that you're gonna love it too. We believe entirely that our communities need books right now as much as independent bookstores need our neighbor's business. And Tattered Cover prides itself on being a community space. And while we cannot be in that physical space right now, we're really excited to have you joining us on this virtual space. And so let's talk about the authors that we have that are going to be joining us in this virtual space here. We have three incredible writers that we have here today. We have Robin Carr, Susan Mallory, and Julia London. And I'm just going to give you a little bit about each of these wonderful women here. Robin Carr was a young mother of two in the mid-1970s when she started writing fiction. An Air Force wife, educated as a nurse, whose husband's frequent assignment changes made it difficult for her to work in her profession. Originally from Minnesota, they lived in all four corners of Texas, Alabama, Florida, Utah, California, Arizona, and Nevada. Little did the aspiring novelist know then, as she wrote with babies on her lap, that she would become one of the world's most popular authors of romance and women's fiction, and that 11 of her novels would earn the number one berth on the New York Times bestselling books list. Susan Mallory is the number one New York Times bestselling author of novels about the relationships that define women's lives, family, friendship, and romance. Library Journal says Mallory is the master of blending emotionally believable characters in realistic situations. And readers seem to agree. 40 million copies of her books have been sold worldwide. Her warm, humorous stories make the world a happier place to live. Susan grew up in California and now lives in Seattle with her husband. She's passionate about animal welfare, especially that of her two ragdoll cats, an adorable poodle who think of her as mom. And last but certainly not least is Julia London. She's the New York Times bestselling and USA Today bestselling author of more than 30 romance fiction novels. She's the author of the popular Cabot Sisters historical series, including Trouble with Honor, The Devil Takes a Bride, and The Scoundrel and the Debutante. She is also the author of several contemporary romances, including Home Homecoming Ranch, Return to Homecoming Ranch, and The Perfect Homecoming. Julia is the recipient of the uh, RT Book Club Award for Best Historical Romance and a six-time finalist for the prestigious Rita Award, Rita Award for Excellence in Romance Fiction. She lives in Austin, Texas. And it is my honor now to welcome these three amazing authors. I'm going to have them join us here and uh, on video. And we're just going to have them get started. Here we go. They should be coming on. Hello, there's Susan. Hi. 
And there's Robin. Hello, welcome. Hi. And Julia's coming. Asked to start video. There we go. There she is. <laughs> Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank Thanks you for having us. Nice yeah, you. we're so excited um, to have you guys here. Um, so I thought I'd give you guys an opportunity to talk about your latest book that is either out already or coming out. And you could tell us a little bit about um, what's in store. So Susan, you're first here on my screen. Would you be all right with starting us off? Sure. My book the friendship is list? The Friendship List, like Yay. the poster. It's 3D. It's 3D. Um, and I wrote it down because as we all know, I can, uh, be easily distracted by a shiny thing or I have a cat here. So there's that, um, <laughs> the friendship list is out on August 4th. Uh, it got moved. So if you thought it was in May, it was, in fact, had this not happened, I would have been on tour right now. Um, which is sad. I miss, I miss the hugs. Um, so this book was really fun for me. Some books are easy and some books are hard. This book was just fun from start to finish. Uh, Ellen and Unity have been best friends forever and they are currently stuck in their lives. Unity because she was widowed very young and Ellen because she's put all of her energy into being a single mom. Ellen who got pregnant at 16, so she's quite young with a, a teenager, um, overhears her son saying he can't go to college because he can't leave her alone. He doesn't think she'll make it without him. And this is a horrible thing for a mother to hear. So she knows she has to convince him that she's perfectly fine. So she and Unity dare each other to complete a series of fun and intimidating, at least to them, challenges so that they can finally start living their lives again. The friendship list really does celebrate friendship. That is at the core. Um, there are love stories, but one of the love stories is the love story you have with your best friend. Um, the book is heartfelt. It's engaging. And... If you've read me, you know I can be funny. This is by far the funniest book I've ever written. It's and so I'm not supposed to say this, so don't tell. But I have to tell you, it's one of my favorites. So that is The Friendship List. I'm very excited. And I'm sorry, the art department did such an incredible job on this. It's when you like, held up the book, comments were like, your cover's amazing. You got isn't so Isn't it beautiful? I'm so yeah. excited. It is, you know, covers are complicated and uh, they can be they can be many stages. And as soon as we saw um, the, the, what they were gonna do with this, it was like that, I want that. Please, 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 I need that cover. So I'm so grateful, it's lovely. They did a great job. And Ms. Robin Carr, can you let us know about Sunrise on Half Moon Bay? Uh, yes, I can. Um, let me think about it. It's about two sisters born um, 20 years apart. So they have never been close. And both of them are going through a huge life transition at the same time. One is just coming out after being a caregiver to her parents for eight years. And she's trying to get her life together. She had very big plans. She just can't seem to remember what they were now that she's got the time to execute them. And um, Justine, her older sister, is going through a divorce after 30 years of marriage. So, so they're both in a in a spot of um, huge transition uh, and it's and it's lots of fun to read about they'll be getting close for the very first time as they live together in Half Moon Bay but what I really want to tell you to just shock your pants off is um, that coming in October is the 21st Virgin River novel oh return to Virgin River that's yay <laughs> Yeah, so it's time to it's time to see some of your old friends, and uh, Mel and Jack will be there uh, giving advice as usual. And uh, there's a couple of new faces, which has been the tradition in Virgin River is that there's a couple of new faces falling in love with all the folks that you're used to and you've grown close to in the background. So. You didn't think I could do 21, did you? Oh, yes, ma'am, I did. <laughs> I, mean, I just, I think you I could. was really excited <laughs> and hopeful. <laughs> Cross your fingers. Cross your fingers. The computer crashed this morning. So, you yes, know. Yes, <laughs> Robin is here by the grace. <laughs> it, by the of her teeth, she is, it is awesome she is here right now because we had some fun technical difficulties with Robin, but we're happy to have her. My Wi-Fi went down. My computer crashed. Everything is... Um, gone to hell in a handbasket. What a day. But I'm here and, and I'm happy to be here. 
And then Ms. Julia London, if you could let us know about your latest, please. Well, this one just came out last week. Yay, it's a, happy book birthday. A Royal Kiss and Tell. It's really kind of hard to see, but I, I did this new series um, set in Victorian England. Um, I wanted to do kind of a take on the Cinderella because when I wrote the first one, The Princess Plan, yep. Megan had just married Harry and it was like, you know, it's just such an enduring story. We all want to marry a prince, right? But I didn't want to do a Cinderella that was powerless, like the original Cinderella. I wanted to do one more like Megan. So I made up this entire kingdom because there were no extra princes running around London and they have princes that come in. And so the second one is about um, a woman in society and she's she knows her place in society and she's like at the top rung and she's not afraid to own it. And so she goes around to ballrooms and she's like, you know, look at me. I mean, you should look at me. I'm so well dressed and I'm beautiful and I have a lot of money and, you know, <laughs> and there's a prince that I've based a little bit on Harry. Some of the interviews I'd read about him when he was, um, you know, disillusioned, he didn't really know what his purpose was. And I made the second prince in this book like that. And he doesn't know what his purpose is. And his purpose so far has been drinking and gambling and whoring. And so they are, they are, um, <laughs> Right off the bat, they're at loggerheads. He doesn't have any time for her and she doesn't, you know, she's not gonna put up with that because she knows who she is. And um, there's a bit of a mystery. I also included a mystery in this series, which I've never done and will never do again. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun, but you know, it's really hard to do that. Um, but yeah, and the third book comes out in October, A Princess by Christmas. And that will be the end of, of this series. And the name of the series is A Royal Wedding. I like I read all three of them and I loved every minute. It was such a great escape and it was so wonderful to just dive into these worlds that you've created. And I'm curious, each of you kind of touched on it a little bit and we can do another round robin, but where does a story begin for you? Is it with the setting, the characters, the plot? You know, you, you mentioned, Julia, you mentioned your fairy tales and, and Cinderella, but like where do these ideas often start from you? If you want to touch on that, Julia, with the Cinderella bit. Um, I think almost, I mean, I would say probably 99% of the time it starts with a character, you know, the idea of a person and what they've been through pops into my head. And then I um, spend a lot of time building a story around it, but it's almost always character for me. And then Susan, you were nodding along. Is that the same for you? It, it depends on the book, where it comes from. Uh, the friendship list is actually pretty funny. I was um, I heard from a reader, it was the end of my work day, I was just about to shut down and there was a message saying, you should write about empty nesters. And I shut down my computer and walked in to start cooking dinner and thought, oh my God, that is never gonna happen. They're gonna be wet in their 50s and nobody wants to see that, that sex. You wanna see them when they're younger, um, if they're gonna be naked. And I thought I would just never do that, that's silly. Pull out all the ingredients and it always happens when I start chopping the onions. And I chopped the onions and I thought, well, what if they're not old? And then I thought, well, what if it's not they? What if it's her? You know, if she got pregnant at 16, her kid would be a senior in high school when she's about 34, 35. Ugh. So technically an empty nester, but not... So, and that was it. And my husband's really used to this. If the knife goes down and I start washing my hands and the onion is half chopped, he's like, so 30 minutes, <laughs> yeah, about 30 minutes, I'll be back. I went and wrote notes and I apologize to the reader. It was a wonderful suggestion. This isn't what you asked for, but I hope you love it anyway, because it was just, so that's where the idea came from. It was me being, you know, snotty and saying, well, I'd never write. Oh yeah, I am going to write that little bit different, but I'm writing that. So is there onion chopping involved with you too, Robin? Do they, do the tears strike inspiration for you or, or how does that, how does it work for well, you? There's, there's, there's tears. Um, I, it always starts with uh, characters and an issue. And uh, this time a young woman has come to Virgin River to finish her novel in progress. She's very late. And the reason she's late is she lost her mother, her best friend, her mentor, her her buddy, her mm. pal, and she's trying to get away from the usual from the usual scenery to be alone 
to um, to finish that book because by God, her mother would certainly want her to finish that book. So the issue is free. And it was really inspired when I, I had contact from um, a young woman who used to play with my children and I was close to her mother. And we stayed in touch all these years and her mother passed away recently and she was an only child. And um, so none of their circumstances are the same, but I was inspired to examine that at what it would be like and what kind of emotions would go along with it. And of course, it being uh, a Robin Carr, it's gonna work out. <laughs> Absolutely. It's got, got a really, really good looking landlord. So <laughs> things are looking up. Well, let's shift to that then. Let's talk about genre. And, and you know, what what is appealing about women's fiction? But then not only women's fiction is that general umbrella, but then, you know, whether it's mystery, historical, contemporary, what draws you to that um, subgenre within women's fiction that you, you've gotten to explore over these years? And, you know, some of you have tried different ones, which, what makes you, what makes one more appealing than the other? Who are you talking to? You, Miss Robin. We'll start with you. <laughs> Just wanted to be sure I wasn't. No, that's good. Go right ahead. I um I I I really really enjoy watching. Well, women are in charge of the relationship and the relationship issues, and it's been that way since um you know since the men went out to hunt the woolly mammoth, and at least they said they were hunting the woolly mm -hmm. mammoth we aren't real sure where they really were. <laughs> women were left with the other women and the families and the children and the older citizens. And, and they worked they worked out all of the issues that, um, that were combined to give trouble to the neighborhood and, um, and to their personal relationships. And so uh, it's still our job. And while we're writing about women's issues and family's issues and all of, and, and romantic issues, because that too is a woman's issue. Um, the men are writing about anything with a ball and a gun. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I love some of the boy books, but um, I, like, I like what I'm doing much better. I like handling these relationship issues. And I think, um, I, and I think it's endless. I think the list is, um, the pot is deep. Yeah. We can keep going back for more. Yeah. Julie, you were nodding. Do you have something to speak to that or something to add about writing women's oh. fiction in your subgenre? I mean, you know, women are just so curious by nature and you always want to know what's going on in the house next door. <laughs> you know, so that's part of it, you know, just <laughs> reading about these other women in their lives. But for me, especially with historical romance, a lot of it is about the escape factor I mean, if you if you are working two jobs and you have kids and you're homeschooling and you know whatever, it's really great to go to a place where masks are for masquerades and you know even though they had cholera, they didn't have corona, so they were still crowded into ballrooms and there were handsome men in suits and you know it's just a complete escape from the um, hardship of your own life. And you still get to read about women and their relationships with sisters and with men and with children and parents. And I don't know, I just, I, I never get tired of reading it and I never get tired of writing it. Susan, do you want to add something? I, I agree with both your points. I think we as women are biologically wired to connect with each other. Um, whether it's sisters or friends, you have a family, you create a family, but wherever we go, whatever we do, we form a unit of whatever, I'm, I'm still traumatized. Years and years ago, I wrote a couple of historicals set in the old West and reading about a pioneer woman who made friends with her chickens, which is still to me, one of the saddest things I've ever read that that's all she had, but she had to have friends in her life. And when there weren't any other women on the prairie, but her, she made her own friends. And so I think it's a biological imperative to connect. And that allows us to, as the writers of these stories, the tellers of the stories, to take the emotion and to deliver it in a way that is scary or heartwarming or funny 
Um, and this is what we remember is the friendships, whether it's falling in love um, romantically, whether it's creating a family unit, that resonates with us. And I think we as women are stronger when we connect and it affirms what we know to be true, that the best lives are about the people we have loved. Um, that is what truly matters. And I think romance and women's fiction celebrates those connections. So yeah. then the no, other God, thing, please add. remember how your mother always told you everything was going to be all right when you thought it was the worst. I mean, that's the, that's the other thing about women's fiction and, and romance because everything is always all right. It always turns out and there's always, a, you know, an uplifting ending, which I, I think is also really appealing. So then I, I'm curious about why do you think that there's still a stigma around romance and women's fiction? It's something that is certainly growing and people are becoming much more open about this as, a, as something that they're reading and something that they're proud of reading. But what, why do you think it's still a stigma and what do you think we can do to fight that, continue to fight it and break that down? Julia, you were talking about happy endings and, and people reading that. Do you mind speaking to that? You know, I've thought a lot about this over the years. I have never actually um, experienced myself, somebody like running down romance or women's fiction to me. And the only thing I can think of is that we, you know, there's a lot of um, conservative values out there that that's, you know, you don't talk about it. You don't, um, you know, you don't get, you're not sent you shouldn't be sentimental. We're all like salt of the earth, get the job done. I don't, that's the only thing I can think of. I don't understand why there's any stigma, but I haven't really experienced it, to be honest. Have, have either you, Susan or Robin, is that something that, that you see? I've seen it a lot. And I think it's just simple misogyny. I think that there's still, there's still a lot of prejudice. If it's important and about women, it's not as important as if it's about men. And uh, I think that the way you fight it is you fight that kind of discrimination against women in general. In general, yeah. Yeah, in a lot of ways. Yeah. How about for you, Susan? Have you seen or experienced it? And do you have any advice for fighting back? It's, um, I don't think it's a fight we win individually. I think we, we win it as a collective. I had it a lot more when I was younger. I wrote a lot of category romances and there was a lot of dismissal. Um, I think that there, we do live in a patriarchal society and it's, we don't even think about it. When you think about coming of age stories, they're almost all men um, or boys. And it just is, it's something that will change over time. I think it, it allows us to, all of us write strong women. And um, I think that is part of what we do, but I cannot tell you how many acquaintances, uh, friends, husbands, or business associates, husbands. Oh, I read your book. It was good. It's like, try not to have quite so much shock in your voice yeah. as you try to come. <laughs> Just a little less shock and a little more. Um, and uh, it, it is just unconscious and uh, it will change with time. And as I said, I think the work we're doing speaks for itself. Yeah. It really does. Again, having read all of these, and, and for those of you who are watching right now, you can either order, uh, pre-order any of these books. I know um, the friendship list is not quite out yet. Um, and then Robin talked about her 21st Virgin River. You can pre-order those on Tattered Cover, and you can get uh, tatteredcover.com, and you can get uh, Julia and Robin's latest as well right now, um, either ship to you or curbside pickup. So you can uh, join in and read those and can you continue to help fight uh, the stigma and enjoy the yeah. escapism and, and um, the, the all rightness that happens at the end <laughs> of all of these. But I'm curious too about, um, please take a step back to writing process, you know, something else that may have changed over time. And um, for you all, you among you are, uh, have a plethora of awards and bestsellers. And I'm curious about your writing process and how that works for you. And then has it evolved over time? Um, Susan, would you give us a little bit of an in insight to that? Um, I write a lot. I've always written a lot. By the time I found out you weren't supposed to, I was like three years in. So I didn't know what to do about that. Um, so I, uh, I am a very serious plotter. I want to know 
my entire story before I start writing. I do not want to get to page 300 and realize, oh gosh, they're not going to fall in love. Um, that would send me screaming into the night. No one wants to see that. So um, I'm a planner, I'm a plotter, and uh, that makes me happy and makes me feel safe when I write. And what I love about it is the more work I do before I start writing, the easier the book is, which makes the book more fun. Um, but it also frees me up to do the little detail things, the the in the background, the the funny little through lines that you can you can't plan; they just happen organically. And I can't imagine trying to keep a plot in my head and characters in my head, figure out where they're going next, and do that stuff too. So I on this there is a spectrum of pantsers, people who write by the seat of their pants. And the people who plot, and I am at the plotting end, and uh, Susan Elizabeth Phillips and I talk about this all the time because we're at the opposite end of the spectrum and we enjoy <laughs> having cocktails together and telling each other, no, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. You, in fact, are the wrongest ever. So yeah, that's what I do. I'm a planner, I'm a plotter, and then it's time to go, I go. Julia, where do you fall on that spectrum? Has it changed over time maybe? Yeah, it's changed. I'm somewhere in the middle. I always have, I know what the story arc is and I know what the, what's going to happen with the characters vaguely. Um, but you know, I started writing in the mid nineties and I was able to work on more than one book at a time. I would work on one in the morning and then I would work on one in the afternoon. Um, and I've always treated this like a job, you know, like I go to the office in the morning. I don't like wait for inspiration to strike. But what I've really noticed over the years is um, it's a lot harder to divide my attention. Like it, I used to be able to do it, but now I can't. I have to work on a book, not two. And I have to really absorb myself in that book um, like full time in order to keep all those threads together, I think. But that's the, that's the big difference for me. Hey. I do want to get Robin's answer, but there's a cat on the screen now. <laughs> so we have to, who's the cat? This is Alex and uh, it's uh, 4.30 here in Seattle and he eats at five. So he's just letting me know it's getting close and uh, he's kind of a big guy. So I'm very handsome. So, well, yeah. Alex, I promise we'll get done in time for dinner. Uh, we'll do our best. <laughs> So, well, thank you for getting to, oh my gosh, the chat just lit up with cat, cat, kitty, cat. <laughs> kitty, 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 yeah. You want to say hi? Say hi. <laughs> so, so, Robin, where do you fall on the spectrum then of pantser, plotter? Has it changed? Total pantser. I, I don't know anything about it except where I'm beginning. I wrote a, I wrote a book about a man who, um, whose wife found out that, that he'd had an affair five years ago but it lasted two years. And I really wow. didn't know when I started that book, if he was just a fallible man who made a mistake or if he was a bastard. And I couldn't wait to find out. But I like to, um, I like to watch the story evolve. Yeah. It doesn't bother me to go back to the beginning and make everything adjust if I have to do that. But I, I like heard. it. I like it like that. I start, I know who the characters are and basically what the important issues are. And that's about all I know. But I love that, okay, between the three of you, we had one on either side and then Julia, who's kind of swaying in the middle. Oh. That really gets, goes to show our aspiring writers out there that really it's your own way. You get to oh, choose yeah. and it, whatever yeah. works for your brain. Right. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to ask one more question before we move to our audience questions. A lot of you have been very active in the chat. Thank you so much for engaging that way. Uh, if you want to start thinking about your questions for one, two, or all three of our authors, feel free to do that. Um, we'll start taking those in just a minute. But I'm curious for the three of you, um, who three of you artists who have provided us with such comfort and such joy um, in, in your work for many years, what are you, what media are you consuming in this age of coronavirus that's making you feel better that you want to share with others? I'm watching a lot of CNN. I don't think that's what it works <laughs> I have to get the numbers every every night, you know? Um, and I start my day with Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> so, but 
I still every evening is the same. I sit in front of the TV with a book in my lap. Yeah. And I'm probably the only person in America who likes commercials because that's when I read. Is that when you read? Yeah. If I if the if the show is compelling, I only read during commercials. So um, so it's the same for me, but um, more more news than ever. And I'm wondering if it's a good idea. I don't want to be yeah. informed, but I don't know. Susan, what are you reading, watching, listening to nowadays? Well, this is what I'm reading. This is how far I am. It's what? really, really good. Oh. <laughs> and this is what's next. So, <gasps> yes! Look at you go. Um, Love I it. know. And if you could see my actual office, because it does not look like this. Um, <laughs> There's books stacked everywhere. So um, hold on, we got another one. Yeah, because oh, somebody this else. Said about this. Oh! Oh. This, is, <laughs> this is Kelly. This is the poodle. This is a poodle. Hi, sweetie. No tongue. Um, <laughs> so um, we are watching a lot of old stuff that we've seen before, so we know how it ends and that it's not super stressful. Um, because I don't want any stress right now. I feel my life is stressful enough. And like Robin, I am watching way too much news. Um, I write, and then at the top of the hour, I watch the first segment uh, till the commercial, and then I go back to work. And uh, I know it's not healthy, mm -hmm. and I too have a massive crush on um, Governor Andrew. I think he's, uh, I just, I appreciate the information, and I like that he's, he just says it. And I, at this, at this place in my life, I just want that. I want just, so I watch the news. It's like, okay, I'm braced. I'm holding my coffee with both hands. Just tell me, and then I'll turn it off and get back to my life. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing. But a lot of older stuff that's, you know, you can relax. I've seen that episode of NCIS 14 times. So I'm fine <laughs> with the temperament. It's okay. I know where it's going. Uh, How about you, Julia? Well, um, I was watching the news and then I had to make myself stop because it was just so depressing. Mm -hmm. And so if I do watch TV, I've been uh, re binging The Office, uh, which I watched many years ago, but I'm watching it again and it still holds up. But I tell you what, I've, I think I've read about 15 books since uh, the beginning of March. I've been a reading fiend it's, because it's a great escape for me too, just to get the hell out of Corona town, you know, and go somewhere else. So yeah, that's the way I've been doing it. No, it's just, it's great to hear how people, what, what they're consuming nowadays, you know, for, for some authors, it's been podcasts and other ones, they're like, I listen to the same record over and over again. Cause it yeah. just keeps insane. And um, so we love just getting to hear a little bit of an insight. Um, so we're going to be taking questions from our chat now. So feel free to ask questions to one, two, or all three of our authors. Um, They've been rather um, kind and open so far about their answers. Uh, so we'll see, uh, we'll see what we get for people asking questions. Um, oh, this one's a really sweet one. Um, how are you doing in this age? They just want to know, are, are you doing okay? And, <laughs> and I think that's a really nice one. It is um, nice one, yeah. So, so Julia, how are you doing? <laughs> well, I, I'm doing okay. It's just, you know, I'm doing okay. We were talking earlier about how this isn't a great change for a writer because you're pretty much secluded in writing all the time. Yeah. I would love to go out to dinner. I would love to get a pedicure, you know, the first world problems. But other than that, I'm fine. How about but you, Robin? How asking. are you? I actually um, kind of like this life. I, I, this, is, this is my choice anyway. I stay, I'm very solitary. I'm very... Um, introverted. I, I love people, love meeting people, love seeing people, but uh, and I'm not at all shy, but um, I, live a, I live a real quiet life and I'm home alone all the time. And I don't write when someone else is in the house breathing my air. So <laughs> I like, um, I like it. So I'm, I'm all right. I miss my kids and um, I would like to see I would like to see more of them than I'm seeing right now, but um, but uh, otherwise it's um, it's a little lonely, but it's uh, it's it's perfectly all right. How about you, Susan? We're doing okay. Um, I'm with Julia. I miss 
a dinner. I want a pedicure. I miss seeing my friends. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, I, people are like, Oh, how's it working at home? It's like, Oh, sweetie, I work at home all the time. Um, (laughs) So that part hasn't changed. It's been weird watching other people. They're like, how do you do the work life balance? It's like, you don't. Some right. days you work a lot and some days you don't. And you, there is no balance. It's, that's yeah. a myth. Don't even try. You're not going to get there. Um, so I miss the normal things that everybody misses. I love the lack of traffic and that's wrong of me. I acknowledge the wrongness of that statement. <laughs> But I can get to my dog's daycare in 15 minutes on a Friday. And it's like, (laughs) normally it's about 30 minutes there and about 30 minutes home. So uh, the lack of traffic is quite thrilling. I do worry about the people though, seriously, the people who are being so affected by this um, economically that I I feel for them. And um, that, that part of it is, is really hard. I mean, the kids not getting meals, that's unconscionable. So yeah. that sort of thing. And the people who are out of work um, is really tough because our, as, as they said, our lives really haven't changed a whole lot. We're, we're working the way we were working six months ago, a year ago. Well, we, we greatly appreciate and the audience does too, your candidness and your honesty. It, it, in a weird way, it still is able to bring us all together to be like, hey, look, our favorite authors are feeling very similar similarly to what we are right now. So thank you for that. Um, so there, um, one question was specifically for Susan, but I think it can apply to all three of you of how hard do you find it to put humor in your books? And Susan, since it was directed at you, um, I'll let you answer first. Um, I think that the thought of men and women trying to live together is inherently funny. And I'm not sure what God was thinking when he made that plan. Um, Someone who just moved in with her boyfriend before this pandemic started and the universe was like, oh, you want to live together? Boom, ultimate test. I get it. (laughs) Exactly. You are so together. You will long to have the house empty. Um, So I don't try to put humor in. I try to find situations that will allow my characters to be funny. Um, Most of my characters are funny. I I briefly, years and years ago when I was writing Category, wrote three, what was then Intimate Moments, which is a suspense-y novel. And it was really hard. Um, As Julia said, don't do that. Um, (laughs) But there was one book I walked around for weeks. There's nothing funny till page 160. And that was so shocking to me it just, it just comes. It's just, I find the world amusing. I think life is inherently funny. Either you laugh or you cry and I prefer to laugh. So um, I, I do try to do situations that are humorous. In, in the friendship list, Ellen um, got pregnant at 16 and, and she hasn't really done that again. So it's been a very long time. And when she goes to do it as a grown up, she's very enthusiastic and it's hysterically funny. So I try to do that kind of stuff. So how about for either uh, Julia or Robin, do you want to touch on um, how hard it might be to put humor in your books? It's not hard for me. Not no? I think I'm hilarious to begin with. So I, <laughs> I think I'm hilarious with every word I put on the page. So <laughs> that's probably why. <laughs> well, you know, I wrote a thriller once and, um, and it did well, my only thriller ever. And it, and it did well. And so people were interested in seeing another one and I couldn't do it again. And it turns out it looking in the rear view mirror that um, I'm not scary at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't ever want to be in a bathtub thinking to myself, what would I do if he came at me now? You know? Yeah. So, I mean, it's natural. I just do what comes naturally. And contemporary women's fiction with a little humor in it is much more natural for me. It's much more natural. Uh, So uh, one of our, one of our viewers wants to know, what does your editing process look like for, um, and I think Robin, for you as a, as a pantser, there's maybe a very different editing process than for the other two. Do you want to start? Um, I I don't know if it's different. It probably isn't different. Um, I do my own revision first, and then I do a revision for my editor, and then it goes through the 
normal process of line editing, copy editing, and and um, onto the printer. Um, uh, that's about that's about all there is to it. It's just that redundant. It goes on and on and on. You, you read that book so many times, you just can't wait to put it to bed. <laughs> I think that um, that first draft. That's what's that's what's so stinking hard about writing, and the and I do the same as Robin. I do a first round of revisions on my own, and that's where I get to go back and fix all of the gaping holes and horrible errors. And there's always a lot, you know. There's mm -hmm. you know like threads dropped and big gaps in time when people aren't together and mystery clues that make no sense. So that, that first round of revisions is hard, but it's satisfying, unlike the first draft for me, which is just hard, period. <laughs> Anything to add, Susan? Um, I, my process is very similar. My first draft is when I plot, and um, to give you a comparison, a book is say 100 to 110,000 words. The plotting for me is gonna be about 18,000 to 20,000 words. So it is the world's tiniest first draft. And that's where I work out all my problems. And I have an additional step. I finish a book, I do a quick read, um, and then I send it to uh, my assistant, Janelle. And she's the, my first read. And depending on what she's, she corrects my typos because I am the typo queen. I just don't see them. Um, and then she will send me back notes. And depending on what the notes are, sometimes I make her changes before I send it in. Sometimes I keep them and I do them all together. It really just depends on what the problem is and um, how, if it's just like some minor stuff I know is gonna come that I'm gonna do later, I don't worry about it. But there have been times I've actually done revisions based on her notes before I send in the book. And so that's, no, that's really cool that you have such wonderful people in your life that you can trust as beta readers to help you out with that process that I know that I've talked with a lot of authors that just say that those beta readers are invaluable for their editing process. So well, I'm going to ask this one last I. question from our viewers before we close out for the evening, but they would like to know what makes in your eyes, the ideal heroine and the ideal hero in your books. Oh, wow. Both of you, all, well, all three of you yeah. had to think about that first thing. You were like, oh, okay. I don't know. I um I think um, somebody asked me what's the sexiest thing about a hero, and I said integrity. That Ooh. is the a number one quality that makes a man sexy in my eyes. And when it comes to women, I had a very lovely gentleman say to me, "You don't fall in love with a face and a body. If you do, you'll be sorry. You fall in love with a heart and a soul." Oh. And so I think that's, um, I think that's, I think everybody, at the end of the day, everybody's beautiful. It's very lovely. I love, I love, the <laughs> I love it that you fall in love with a, a heart and a soul. That's great. Oh. Susan, what makes the ideal hero and ideal heroine for you? Um, when I am writing a book, I want the heroine to be somebody I want to go have lunch with. I want to like her. I want to want to be friends with her. Um, I want a relatable person. And one of the great parts about being a writer is you get the rules. So in my books, you earn your happy ending. Uh, there are no mean, icky people who are going to get a happy ending in my book. You're just not. It's my world and those are my rules. So for me, I want the heroine to be a friend. I want to like her. I want to, I'm going to go on this journey with her. Um, and we have to get along or that's going to be there. There's going to be trouble and she's going to get rewritten, which she will not enjoy. Um, I, I agree with Robin. I think integrity is important in a hero. For me, what I always want, and I think this is a secret female fantasy, the hero has to see something in the heroine that no one else has seen. And it has to be unique to him and unique to her that he sees her and that she is everything he wants. And that moment when he recognizes this is the person, this is the one, and he cannot let her get away. He cannot, he cannot walk away no matter what his conflict is. That's the moment I want. But there is, there is something magical about being seen truly for yourself and having the person you're in love with 
get it and love you and, and want you to be the best you. So that's my ideal hero. And of course it's romance. So they're all good looking. They're always good looking. Always. All dark, broad shouldered. For me, the hero has to have a sense of humor. Number one rule. But he is sort of like what Susan said. He has to have the ability to listen. And he may not listen in the beginning, but he begins to listen and hear her. Because I think that's one thing a lot of women um, in their daily lives don't get, you know, mm -hmm. people that hear her. And for the heroine, um, I want a heroine who is true to herself. Um, you know, I started writing historicals back when Regency was such a, you know, it was really hot Jane Austen. And in when and the characters were supposed to be very polite and unassuming and I've kind of gotten away from that so I want the heroines to really really um be who they are but then they also have to have a character arc that you know they have to be able to listen and have a sense of humor and see their flaws too Thank you three so much for not only this amazing chat, but again, for the art that you give us and the stories that you let us escape into. I know that I'm not alone along with these many viewers that we have here today to just say thank you. For those who um, maybe came into this as a fan of one author and have been introduced to the other two for the first time, I would love to go around uh, the circle one more time just to remind people who you are, your new book coming out, and maybe where they can find you on the internet. So Susan, you wanna start us off? Yes, I'm Susan Mallory. Um, my book is The Friendship List, and you can reach me at susanmallory.com. I have Facebook, very active on Facebook, especially on the bad writing days. You will find me there more. Um, and on Twitter, but yeah, if you just go to susanmallory.com, you can link to everything. And I've got a couple of really great contests with The Friendship List, so please enter. One of them has 2,000 prizes, so your odds are really, really good. Wow. I like it. And Robin, where can everybody find you? Uh, you can find me on Facebook too. Um, and, uh, and likewise, I spend way too much uh, time on, on Facebook. Um, my book, the current book is Sunrise at, on Half Moon Bay and coming in October, um, Return to Virgin River. And Julia? Um, I'm Julia London and I have a, a Royal Kiss and Tell and the third book in this series, A Princess by Christmas, will be out in October, early October. And I am also on Facebook, but I am more on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm Julia F. London at both of those places. And I'm McKaylee Osley with Tattered Cover Bookstore. I just want to thank you guys once again for joining us. You can find all of these authors' books at tatteredcover.com. Links are below in the descriptions. And you can pre-order The Friendship List and Return to Virgin River um, as well. So if those sound interesting to you, go ahead and support your local independent bookstore. And um, don't forget that during this time, there's also local restaurants that need your help as well. Um, so when you're ordering out on those apps, um, try and just continue to shop local. The only reason that we can continue doing these events is through your support. So thank you guys for continuing to support us. We hope you guys are staying safe and healthy and we'll see you um, for our next live streams. Again, we have Sarah Rip Richardson, um, another romance author on June 15th, as well as for younger readers, we have Avi and Brian Polka on June 9th. So thank you guys again. If authors, you'll just stay on for a hot second. We're going to end the stream and thank everyone again. <laughs> so bye everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.